Good evening, Sani Bonani, Goeie Naand, uh, Dumilang. My name is Dries Pretorius and I'm the General Counsel of UJ. It is my honour and privilege to welcome everyone on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor and the University to the professional inauguration of Professor Dominique Uizea Mana. A warm welcome to all of you, the family, friends and colleagues of Dominique, to this joyful and landmark moment. In particular, welcome to profession, Professor Daniel van Lille, uh, Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics, and uh, joining us online, Professor Benon Basheka, uh, our respondent. Professor Basheka is a Professor of Governance and the first Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the Kabbalah University. Also, a warm welcome to all members of the Senate uh, and other colleagues and guests who are joining us here and via our online platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, the inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which a newly appointed professor is inducted into office and deliver the inaugural address. The ceremony of inauguration of professors has its roots in medieval universities and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an express expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the relevant discipline and showcase their, showcase their research. Thirdly, it stands out as a moment of pride and celebration for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university and society. In essence, it is a celebration on the achievement of major milestones, contributions to the disciplines, and ultimately the impact on society, and I think more so with your address tonight. Today we gather to witness the entry of Professor Uwizaimana to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. This evening we will listen to Professor Uwizaimana as one further step in a journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture is over. It is self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body the work in disciplines. Dominique, we are looking forward to your address. Thank you so much. I now invite Executive Dean Professor Daniel van Lille to introduce Professor Uwe Zayimana. I thank you, Riala Boga, Sia Bonga, bye danke. Good evening, dear colleagues. Good evening, our dear guests uh, who are sharing this evening with us here in person and also online. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight to the UJ community. And then a very, very special warm welcome, Dominique, you. to you. Thank you so much. We've walked a long road and to see you tonight and to meet your family under these wonderful, wonderful celebratory conditions is such a privilege. Thank you so much, Paul. And then to your family who are with you tonight, wife, your youngest daughter, and your son, and your second daughter. Um, son. Ah, okay. So, oh yes, yes, now I see everybody's here. Yes. 
So it is, uh, thank you very much for sharing your husband and for sharing your father with us. To become a full professor is almost a labor of love. And you have to dedicate yourself to that level of intellectual fitness every single day. And uh, to you for your sacrifice. And uh, as I said earlier tonight, if you listen to Dad tonight, you'll understand why he worked every day. Thank you very much for your sacrifice. And to also your family who are probably online, thank you very much for your contribution. So, dear friends and family, tonight it's my privilege to introduce you to Prof. Dominique Ivuzimana. And um, I think, uh, Dominique, when I walk the passages, I always hear your students and your colleagues saying, Prof. D. So, I will continue in that fashion to also call you Prof. D. tonight, if you don't mind. You are welcome. <laughs> Professor Dominique Ivuzimana specializes in public policy, program and project implementation and evaluation. He professes in the School of Public Management, Governance and Public Policy of the College of Business and Economics here at the University of Johannesburg. Now, Prof. D's goal is to grow into, into an internationally seasoned, well-rounded public policy analyst and his role in building collaborative networks on the African continent is indeed clear. Prof. Dominique holds in the field of public management and governance a Bachelor's of Arts with distinction from UWC, a BA Honours also with distinction from the University of Stellenbosch, my alma mater as well, and a Master of Social Science and UCT and then finally, he saw the light and achieved a Doctor of Literary Effort from the University of Johannesburg. He's also an if rated researcher. He's rated as a C-rated uh, researcher, which means that he is an established researcher. And when you consider the reports on his rating, uh, it kind of breaks down to two basic components. The first one is that from a theory point of view, he specializes in the field of public administration, management and governance. And then he interfaces with the field of human rights, leadership for social justice, democratic governance and sustainable development. But he's not just a theorist, he's also a practitioner. And that would be make you a pragmademic, I Thank suppose. He, his practice is in public policy analysis and management, where he focuses on program monitoring and evaluation, and then notably in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. Prof. D has also published extensively, as reflected in some 80 articles in reputable journals, one book and two book chapters. Over the past decade, Prof. Dominique has supervised over 130 honors research projects, 15 master's graduates, and four doctorates to completion. And he is obviously, in the light of this excellent delivery, a sought after international examiner of a new generation of theses and dissertations. He is also a member of reputable associations, for example, the South African Mentoring and Evaluation Association, <coughs> the South African Association for Public Administration and Management, and many others. So he also therefore reaches out, not just as a teacher and somebody who learns continuously, but also as a researcher, discovering new knowledge, bringing a deeper level of understanding in but also gives back to the broader community to which he belongs. So, he serves as an external examiner and moderator for several local and international universities, and obviously then as a reviewer for local and international journals. So, with this very brief summary, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce to you our new professor, Dominique Uvzimana. Thank you so much. 
Good evening. Vice Chancellor Functionary, Mr. Dries Pretorius, General Counsel of the University of Johannesburg, the Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics, my Dean, Professor Daniel Vanir. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. Really, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. The respondent, Professor Benoni Basheka, Professor of Governance in the Department of Governance and the first Deputy Vice Chancellor for the Academic Affairs at Kabari University in Uganda. Thank you so much, sir, for being my role model and for availing yourself today to be here with me and to be my respondent. That is something that I will cherish forever for the rest of my life. To Prof. Christel Oriakombe, Prof. Danny Meyer, Dr. Tassinim Majam, and all my colleagues in the School of Public Management and the Public Policy who are present here today and those who are following online, thank you so much. We have been a great team and a winning team for that matter. And that is something I will also cherish for the rest of my life. You are the reason for me to be here. Professor Fanny Kruta, I'm sure you're referring online. Wherever you are, thank you so much for allowing me to stand on your shoulders. You are my supervisor, and on top of that, you remain my friend forever since long time ago, since we met in 2004 at the University of Stellenbosch. My friends, Mr. Daniel Muhaimana and Diane from Iradukunda from Deban, thank you for driving that, that long journey to be here with me today. Mr. Netonje family, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here on behalf of the family and on behalf of my father, my, my father, your father, who is not here today, but who is here through you, and Aedzo, Tonje, and Itani, Raripada. Uh, Mr. Netonje, I know you would prefer to be chasing the president, telling us where he is. He works at Power FM, and he always is with the president. So for availing yourself, I take it as something of a friendship, which start, was started by your father and continuing with you, with you your, his children, after he passed on. And that is something very important to me. My friend at the University of Mpumaranga, Dr. Rasodi Manyaka and Dr. John Morepo are stuck on the road for some reasons, but I'm sure you're following online. So thank you, say, for your attempt to be here. You are here even though you are online. My compatriots across the globe, in Africa, Europe, and America, following online, thank you so much for availing yourself. Some of you should be sleeping. Others should be working, but you made it here, and that's something I will appreciate for the rest of my life. My students, past and present, undergraduate and postgraduate, my postdocs, past and present, my classmates from UWC, University of Stellenbosch, UCT, and UJ, thank you so much. You were my friend before. You remain my friends, and let us keep on the fight to become the best we are meant to be. Now, allow me to thank the following people, without whose support I would not be standing here today. First, my creator, or as my mother would say, Rurema, our creator, who created an ever-ending chain of reaction <coughs> that led to my existence through thousands of forefathers and mothers, hereby represented online by my only surviving mother today. Thank you, ma'am. I have no doubt <coughs> that all of them <coughs> were a bunch of geniuses because as Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 says, you will know them by their fruits. I am the fruit. Thanks, my wife. Anna Maria, my children, thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Decalogue. Thanks a lot for your love. Thanks for your care and support. 
It takes a lot to become a professor, as the prophet Daniel has said. But the pain is worth it. Today is your celebration. You sent me for a hunt. I got a lion and an elephant, not a rabbit. I'm only standing here to represent you. Thank you, my wonderful family. Thank you so much. As colleagues here and the colleagues online, as you have heard from uh, the invitation and the prof from the introduction done by Professor Daniel Vanir, my dean, I help people to understand the public policy at the University of Johannesburg. Many of you have been asking me what I do for a living. That's exactly what I do for a living. <clears throat> and that is why my presentation is today is titled Inquisitione Veritatis, loosely translated in search of the truth about the specific historical, socio-economic, and the political factors beyond the 7 c protocol that can influence the success or failure of public policy implementation, not only here in South Africa, but across Africa. So, standing here today, I'm going to try to help you understand the key variables that influence the public policy implementation with a specific reference to the African context. Let me start with the, intro the introduction. But before I do that, here is an outline of my presentation. Good. I will, I will start with a brief, a brief introduction. Then I try to explain and define a public policy. Then explain what a public policy implementation is before I go to the variables inf influencing a public policy failure or success. I will spend a bit of time at discussing the main argument about the 7 c protocol. Then discuss the problems with the current study on variable inf influencing a public policy implementation. That will be before I discuss the historical, socio-economic, and the political factors beyond the 7 c protocol that I believe are the main cause of public policy implementation failure in Africa, and which I believe have not been covered in the current literature. I will then provide some conclusion and recommendations of what to do to solve the problem. By way of introduction, The variables influencing a public policy success or failure are commonly known as the 5C protocol. This was later extended to become the 6C protocol and then the 7C protocol. These variables have saved for quite a long time as a very important theoretical framework for South African and African public implementation scholars, practitioners, and students However, the literature and the, 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 and the scholar who compiled it, and the those who analyzed it, to develop the five key variables that influence the public policy implementation, are mainly from Western dev developed countries. And I can argue strongly that they did not have the historical background, the cultural background, the socioeconomic background, as well as the political background, which affect public policy implementation on the African con continent. With the aim, however, therefore, because those scholars have a little to no experience and understanding of the unique socioeconomic, cultural, and historical context of the African continent, they have created a gap, a gap and a gap in literature about why public policy implementation continue to fail on the African continent. 
Therefore, with the aim to fill the gap in terms of knowledge, my presentation analyzes the specific historical, socioeconomic, and the political factors beyond the 70 c protocol that I argue are the main cause of public policy implementation, failure, and success on the African continent. <clears throat> to assist my younger daughter here and my colleagues here and online who have not had the chance to sit in my public policy class, I will start by defining public policy. Public policy is what a government intends to do. It's the government intention to do something or to do nothing. Therefore, a public policy is what a government does or does not in the public interest. I'm sure that is a simple definition of public policy, um, which can be used, which will be used throughout my presentation. In other words, in every situation affecting the public, the society, government has two options. First option, to do something about the problem which is affecting the society. Second option, to play its quite a diplomacy and do nothing, also in the public interest. So what is the public policy implementation? Public, public, public policy implementation is both a noun and a verb. And as a noun, it means achieving the objective of a public policy which has been implemented. However, as a verb, it means the process, the steps that one must take in order to achieve the objective of a policy that has been implemented. Let's make it simple for everybody. If the problem affecting society is the lack of road infrastructure, then public policy implementation is providing road infrastructure where there is a need for it. If public if the problem affecting the people is about COVID-19, public policy implementation is about making sure that the public wear a, wear a mask, wash hands, sanitize, and keep social distance. I'm sure that also makes it, makes it easier for everybody to understand what a public policy is in layman's term. As one would expect, not all public policy implementation succeed. Some do fail. However, public policy failure is not the opposite of public policy success. Because a policy can succeed in some aspects and fail in the others. I like to give you the example from my native country, where uh, the government of Rwanda in 2010 implemented what it is known as the Vision 2020. Vision 2020 was implemented by the Rwandan government in order to achieve the middle income status in 2020. By 2022, Rwanda is not a middle income status, but hey, our capital city, Chigari, is known as the, the, the cleanest capital in Africa. It's not, all is not lost. Statistics shows that 84% of public policy sector do face some, some sort of failure. However, public policy implementation failure is not limited to government, to projects, programs, and the policies implemented by government. It also affects some uh, policies and the programs implemented by international organizations, such as the World Bank. And in fact, between 25 and 50 percent of programs supported by the World Bank and the IMF do experience some sort of failure. Some major failure which are known across the continent are the Structural Adjustment Program introduced by the World Bank in 1980s. By, by 1990s, everybody agreed that the Structural Adjustment Program across many countries on the continent 
failed to achieve their objectives. And in fact, by the closing of the program, many countries which implemented the, the structural adjustment program were worse off, both socially and economically. It's not a secret that most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa failed to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in 2015. Hence, in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were introduced with the hope that it will be, its objective will be achieved in 2030. When a public policy implementation fails, it creates major problems to society, not only to government, but also to the citizens of countries where public policies have failed. Some of the consequences I can highlight here from my research as Prof. Daniel has already mentioned is that public policy failure leads to a wastage of public resources. Of course, the implementation of public policy requires is the investment of a major part of the country's budget. So when a public policy fails, it leaves a big hole in the country's uh, budget. In addition, when a public policy fails, and that's very important, it leaves many people in abject poverty. Not only in abject poverty, but with also a debt. Because in most, most of the time, government has to borrow money to implement the public policies, it build the infrastructure. But if that infrastructure was not provided, the debt must still be paid by people who did not benefit from the investment. Uh, this is a major problem in Africa. Public policy implementation failure is a major problem in Africa. And hence, most people Many people, especially in the sub-Saharan African uh, countries, remain poor. And they are poor while we live on a continent that is supposed to be rich in terms of its mineral and natural resources disposal. Africa has uh, some 30% of world mineral reserves, 30%. 40% of the world's gold up to 90% of chromium and platinum, 65% of the world's arable uh, land, and 10% of fresh water. But half of the population on the continent lives in abject poverty. Why? Because all attempts to implement a public policy to alleviate the living standard, to uplift the living standard of people, have, in most cases, failed. Public policy failure is not limited to poorer countries. A country such as Nigeria, which has oil reserve for 237 years, yet four out of 10 Nigerians are as poor as a citizen in Burundi or the Republic, the Central African Republic. Literature has shown that there are quite a number of variables that lead to public policy success or failure. Those variables have been uh, listed as 5C protocol, 6C protocol, and the 7C protocol. All of them where any attempt by different scholars to explain the causes that the causes of public policy implementation failures on the continent. The 5C protocol were initially created by Dr. Adir Najam, who is the current inaugural dean of the Frederick Pardi School at the Global Studies and the professor of international relations and the F and environmental and environment at Boston University in the United States. He did that. He created a list of 5C protocol, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, in 1995. Dr. Najam's 5C protocol were extended in 2005 by Professor 
Professor Petrus Brainard, then a professor of public administration at the University of Pretoria. In 2015, however, Dr. Verna Bega, a lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch, added the one variable communication to make it the 7C protocol. The initial 5C protocol were content, context, capacity, commitment, and the client and the coalition. Let me give you a glimpse of what the 5C protocol and then the 5, 7C protocol are. And I will ask you as I move, I move through the slides, please notice the surname and tell me which one you could think comes from the African continent. It's a challenge to the viewers online and the one sitting here. Because I will read Masmanian and the Sabatia, I uh, will read Smith, Hangrove, and I took a month actually looking at the, where these authors come from. Most of them are Americans, uh, British, and other Western countries. I couldn't notice a single surname that looks like yours and mine. You will agree with me. Let's move to this one. Where Brainard and, uh, and the beggar tried to extend the 5C protocol but by adding communication and coordination. Again, a challenge to you online and all of you sitting here, please tell me which surname do you think belongs to the African continent? Forget the beggar, forget uh, Brainard. I have added them myself, them, them myself here. But you will agree with me that most of these authors are um, Western, from Western countries. And that is a serious problem. And I'm going to explain why it is a problem here. Before I, but before I do that, let me explain what the 5C and the 7C protocol are all about. Did I move fast? Yes, I did. Okay, this is the main argument about the 7C protocol. They argue that public policy implementation will succeed or fail because of the content, because of the context, because of the commitment to implement the public policies, and because of the client and the coalition. Let me stop here a bit. My analysis of literature shows me clearly that the authors who published the 5C protocol have a Western mind, were trying to solve Western problems, and therefore there is a bias in terms of analysis of these variables. If, for example, let's say they talk about the current and the coalition. If you take an African country where 21 out of 55 countries are dictatorship and authoritarian. Does a dictator need to make a coalition with anybody? In fact, even most African countries which are not a dictatorship, and here I'm excluding South Africa for the moment, I'm excluding Botswana and the Mauritius, the three known democratic countries on the continent, but even in South Africa. Since 1994 to today, when things are, are starting to change, especially at a municipal level, the ANC has been ruling controlling the majority of parliament. Did the ANC need the DA? No. The DA was mostly insignificant, especially at the national level, to the point where the first democratic president, Mr. Nelson Mandela, and Mr. Thabo Mbeki, dared to refer to opposition parties in South Africa at the moment as a Mickey Mouse. What they meant, they were so small to make an influence to overturn a decision taken by the ANC. Do you really need that much a coalition? Is the failure of government really depends on whether there was a coalition or not? If we use the example of Rwanda, my president wins the 97% of the elections. There is no opposition party, no free media, no nothing. If there is a failure, it's not because the opposition party or the civil society have stood in the way of government to implement a public policy. That's the point. Those are the things you find in Europe where 
people, citizens, specifically citizens, have a right to influence a public policy or even to remove a government from power if it fails to meet, to, to meet its objectives. Let me move quickly to capacity, communication, and coordination. I completely agree with Brainard. I completely agree with, uh, with, with Bega, but I have a problem. I don't believe capacity, communication, and coordination are freestanding variables that influence public policy because my research over the past 10 years shows clearly that the three variables are part of the generic public policy management, which I have I did not summarize them, uh, Ruta Gurik sum summarized them as a PSD, C-O-R-B, post-corp. P stands for planning, S for, for staffing, D for directing, C for coordinating, CO for coordinating, R for reporting, B for budgeting. They are also part and parcel of the project management body of knowledge. Therefore, in my view, they are important but they are not really something that should have been added to the, 5C, to the original 5C protocol. Okay. As I have mentioned, some problems with the current study on the variables that influence the public policies is that all uses the Western literature not interested much in African, uh, in, in the uh, African context. And uh, therefore, all of them have a little to no application except the communication in the capacity uh, on the African continent. I would argue also that in addition to my argument that most of the sources they were from Western countries, I will also argue that Professor Fanny Kruta, my supervisor, I know you are listening to me now, we, I completely agree with you that the capacity is a major problem on the African continent. But I believe that your, the, the decision by Professor Kruta was based on a study which uh, he did in the East African Asian country. My professor took a study visit there in 1998. In 1999, he, pro he published a book uh, titled, At Full Speed, The Tiger Cub Stumbles. There is no tiger cub in Africa, and I completely agree, I totally agree, uh, agree with you, but I believe in addition to capacity, you would have discovered something which I'm going to show in the next slide in order to really deal with the issues that affect the public policy implementation on the African continent. And these are the problems. The problems I'm listing here are based on a 10 years research and they are leadership and the bad governance in Africa. They are a lack of capacity and the capable state to manage public policy implementation in Africa. I completely agree with you in terms of capacity. They are also about lack of ICT capacity in terms of availability, access, affordability, reliability, and the ability and the willingness to use the ICT. They are corruption. How can you do? How can you look for variables that influence the public, public policy implementation of success or failure and the fail to notice the corruption is a big problem. Colonialism is a serious problem and the exploitative economic systems which were established a long time ago at the expense of the African people. I will show you they are still, the, the system has not changed. Debt and over indebtedness which lead to dependency and also, which is a result of what I call crooked colonial economic systems that benefited the West at the expense of African people. Conflict and wars across the continent, climate change, global warming, and the pandemic. Let me briefly explain what I have just summarized above. Leadership is a serious problem on the continent. And there should be no argument that lack of leadership leads to major 
hamper public policy implementation, either here or in the in Western countries. Of course, we all know that the colonialism and the slave trade had nothing to do with the well-being of African people. However, bad leaders did not end with colonialism in Africa. Chinua Achebe, in 1983, looked at his country with all the natural resources available there, found an oil refinery, yet you have 237 years of, of oil reserve, no, refi no oil refinery. Look at the pouring situation in which many Nigerians live, four out of 10 live in abject poverty, as I have mentioned the above. And he concluded that the only trouble that affects Nigeria is the failure of leadership. In addition to that, when his heart was bleeding, he came to the conclusion that maybe the beautiful ones are not yet born. That was a very breaking moment for a person who is well respected across the, the globe. To look at the 500 billion Nigerians and think maybe, that maybe, the one the one who can save the people in Nigeria is not yet born. Africa has had some examples of good leaders. Thomas Sankara is well known for having uh, ruled uh, Burkina Faso for just uh, four years, but made great impact on his people in terms of providing, implementing, implementing public policies that led to improve the education that led to improve the uh, food schemes, that led to infrastructure. Of course, there will, there will be others. I'm just giving you one example, but there are quite a few. They are not yet as enough as one would expect. Lack of capacity of, in terms of ICT. This problem of lack of ICT capacity has been highlighted by the pandemic. Where countries with ICT managed to provide e-service, including education to their children, while the countries with no ICT capacity, their children had to repeat the year in which they were before the pandemic, mid-2019. So they lost either between one and two years academic year. That will have serious consequences of that on, on, on that generation. However, the availability of capacity is not enough if there is no willingness to use the available ICT. And uh, for some reasons, I logged in um, one, one country's e-home affairs. And I was looking for progress, to, to check the progress of the document I had applied for, to only be greeted by this message I think it's nice, isn't it? I should read it. Um, home affairs, we care. However, e home affairs site is closed due to the nationwide lockdown. And this service will only resume in the future, probably after the, the pandemic. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Aaron. When will we need e-home affairs more than during the pandemic? How can you dare tell people that the e-home affairs is closed due to the nationwide lockdown, as though people will get COVID-19 via SMS or email or logging into your website? So you understand that the availability of ICT is not going to help if there is no either capacity or willingness to use it to save the people. Let's go to corruption. Guys, I don't have to say much in terms of corruption. You are a witness of what corruption can do.
to weaken a government and weaken it in a way that it will not be able to provide the public, uh, pu to implement a public policy. It is, research shows that Africa loses at least one trillion in illicit financial flow, and that has been going on for 50 years. You tell me how many, how many, how many billions, how many trillions Africa has lost. Where did it come, look at Africa. Can you find 50 billion, 50 trillion? But there is evidence that this money is being lost by the African continent every year, and it has been going on for the past 50 years, and it's not going to stop by the way. Many of you from South Africa know very well about the state capture. And it is assumed or estimated that it has taken out of the uh, South African, uh, South Africa, 500 billion over the past 10 years. That's quite a lot of money. So, and this is not a problem in South Africa only, it's a problem in other African countries. Perhaps the South Africa is more open. We can know more about South Africa than we know. Uh, uh, about other Af African countries because of the reasons I have just mentioned above. A little bit of democracy here and less democracy the other side. My colleague, Professor Pierre Olumumba from Nairobi, once argued that in fact, corruption has killed more people than civil war it was in Africa, all of them combined. And in his view, we should treat corruption as a crime against humanity. I completely agree with this gentleman. Colonialism is something that makes people shake, especially uh, some, some researchers. But my argument is that when the colonialism and the, and the slavery was uh, implemented by colonizers, all of them from the West, they had no base interest for, of the African people, they never created, implemented any policy in the interest of African people. And therefore, they left Africa with no infrastructure and with citizens in abject poverty. However, I agree and argue strongly that the, col the colonial system that was established then has not ended with colonialism. Because my research shows that some French former French, I, I use the former uh, very sparingly because it looks like some French, some former French colonies are still required now, as I stand here, to pay a deposit of between 50 and 80% of their savings into French, French bank. And that is because of the pact of the continuation of colonialism signed by France and its, and, and its former uh, French colonies. However, this is not the only problem. It, it is, the other problem is that, actually, while colonizers are not sitting in offices in, Afri in African countries, they manage to create institutions that make it easy to keep control over their former colonies. Those who are from a British tradition, you know the Commonwealth. I, who come from the French civilization, know the Organisation Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. All of them chaired either by a French president or a British queen, and all coron co co uh, former colonies being members, which gives straight and direct control on the resources by the former colonizers, when you take resources from a country, you weaken it from, uh, you weaken its ability to implement a public policy. That's the main argument. Let's go to this one. debt. Guys, okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, there you go. Over indebtedness. Many of you have a home loan. Others have a, finance, a, a car financed by the bank. When you don't pay, you receive calls from unknown numbers. And that usually happen, also happens when a country doesn't pay its debt. 
it is estimated that up to over 50% of the national budget of many countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, are financed by debt. Hence, the, most of those countries face over indebtedness. Once you are over indebted, all the resources that you, you receive first goes to paying debt. And therefore, less is left to implement a public policy. You cannot, therefore, eliminate over indebtedness as a major factor that influence lack of public policy implementation in Africa. The other problem is the conflict, and it started with a C also. There you go, conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm standing here, there, there are at least 15 African countries which are involved in an open war or conflict across the African continent. War is a serious problem because it takes away the money that was supposed to be used to implement the public policies, to buy guns, to deal with emergencies created by, by war. And um, all of that, on top of that, war destroys the infrastructure and therefore make countries keep repeating, re the doing things the re they have done long time ago, not moving forward. There is a view that most of the wars being fought in Africa have something to do with the mineral exploitation because most of the conflict tended to happen in areas that are rich in natural resources, which brings into question whether those, some of those wars are not financed actually by former colonies or Western countries who want cheap resources. Explain it to me. How does a, a guy who cannot read or write in the eastern part of Congo has a Karachinikov? Yes, Congo does not manufacture a matchbox. How do you explain that? We know where Karachinikov is made, and therefore that's where it comes from. I will end with this one, ladies and gentlemen. Climate and the global change, and, 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 and climate, climate change and the global warming, as well as the ability to manage the pandemic, is, is has been, is, and is, continue, is going to continue to be a major problem that affects public policy implementation. And that there is no single country, if you look at the map there, if, you not, if, no country is, if a country is not facing a, a, a desert or, or a drought, it is facing heavy rain. I don't have to say much from the South African point of view. You just want, have to watch the news and see how much infrastructure has been demolished in KwaZulu-Natal, how many people have died, and how many people have been displaced, which means government is going to make that one a priority, taking resources from where it was supposed to, to, to be used to deal with the issues of emergency. In conclusion, Ladies and gentlemen, I completely agree that um, the 5C, 6C, and the 7C protocol are a very important component of public policy management teaching at many South African universities. I have been, I have, I've been taught this, and I'm still teaching this one uh, till I discover that something is missing. I argue that Africa has its own history its socio-economic challenges, its culture and its people. And I have, I'm a witness that those challenges were not considered by Western literature and that they don't feature in current literature or public policy implementation. Of course, that is the reason why public policy implementation continue to fail Despite the abundant natural resources in the African continent, and we still don't know what are the main cause of public policy implementation failure in Africa. Therefore, all the few factors I have outlined in my presentation, and the those I might have missed, which I will find in the future, should be included to enrich Western literature because they are the true causes of poor, 
public policy implementation on the African continent. Um, there you go. For those who speak in my mother tongue, Murakoza Chane Kudute Gamatwi, Accent Sana Kwa Kusikiriza, Merci beaucoup d'avoir écouté. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, the members of Senate and the senior management team of the university, the executive dean and the faculty dean, the professors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'm humbled to be the respondent on the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor D, as he has been called. And uh, the purpose of an inaugural lecture is normally to introduce a new professor into the university and then to allow the new professor share his or her uh, research interest to the wider academic community within the university and the outside uh, world. And uh, it is normally not a day for other speeches other than the presenter himself, but I was requested to be a respondent within only seven minutes. Africa is a continent that is breeding. It is a continent that is at crossroads because of the challenges it faces, poverty, corruption, misrule, or bad governance, uh, inequality of an imaginable uh, magnitude, human rights violations, and all these are a result of uh, the failures in the public policy implementation. And therefore, an inaugural lecture centered around uh, the success or the failure of public policy in Africa is extremely very relevant uh, under the questions which the presenter has raised, the theories we, he has uh, uh, highlighted in his presentation, the top-down theories, the bottom-up theories and the uh, the mixed methods, uh, the, the mixed mode uh, of policy implementation are relevant. And policy uh, implementation touches on every citizen, whether you are in South Africa, whether I'm in Uganda or any other country, because uh, it is a result of the, uh, the, the, the policies which are implemented that we get to know uh, what works and what does not work. And Africa is unlucky uh, in that almost across the 55 countries that constitute the continent uh, with the new West South Sudan, you will find almost they have similar problems in terms of policy implementation. Uh, and this is normally due to the poor planning or non-existent planning systems in most of the countries. You will find the bureaucracy stumbles around uh, policy implementation you also find uh, the challenges of some policies which are imposed on countries or organizations, and then they do not meet the, the reality on the ground. And sometimes the policies are changed along the way by the politicians to meet their own needs. Of course, the problem of corruption and the disconnect between the, the, the beneficiaries' expectations and what government's uh, policy formulators decide. Now to Dominic, uh, we thank you for your presentation and we welcome you uh, to the high table of the chief priests of academia. And uh, I only encourage you to do what professors are supposed to do. One, uh, you know they are supposed to teach, they are supposed to research, and they are supposed to do community engagement. Serve your university, uh, which has bestowed the professorship to you. 
you should be able to solve your uh, your college you should be able to solve the faculty and the department and above all you should be able to solve uh, the discipline through promoting uh, the discipline uh, which is public administration but specifically focusing on public uh, policy to all colleagues in south africa greetings from uganda and i wish you happy deliberations i was only given seven minutes so i end my remarks there thank you very much Uh, now invite <coughs> Professor Mazzimano. You can stand in front there, we're going to bring it to you. Then, yeah, I just want to close you right next to me. Okay, that's it. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Professor Uwezimana, thank you, sir. Professor D, thank you, Professor sir. Dominique, I wish to extend my personal congratulations to you, the congratulations, congratulations of the Vice Chancellor in the University of Johannesburg, thank you. for you to be inaugurated as a professor tonight. Thank you, sir. Okay. I found your inaugurational lecture very, very interesting, elucidating. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I sincerely hope that we find those leaders. And then when we found those leaders, they take heed of, heed of your guidance, and that they will achieve resilient success in uplifting our people, uplifting them from poverty, and bettering their living standards. Once again, congratulations. It's a fantastic achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank you. 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 Thank you, sir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's close. That's, um, I about to clear the procedure.